Okay, good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, welcome to the JSGS public lecture uh, entitled today, Climate Change, Land and Food, Implications for Saskatchewan. And this is presented by Professor Margot Halbert, who is Professor and Canada Research Chair, Tier 1, in Climate Change, Energy and Sustainability Policy in the Johnson Chair and Graduate School of Public Policy. So the school, the JSGS, is a provincial center for advanced study and research in public policy and administration. The school is a product of a partnership between the University of Regina and University of Saskatchewan and was based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that defines Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan is renowned for its innovation and the JSGS is yet another example of this with the combined expertise and resources of two universities that have established the school as source of respected policy advice and commentary. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on Treaty 4 here in Regina and Treaty 6 land uh, in Saskatoon and the traditional homeland of the Métis. Uh, my name is Bruno Duperon. I'm a faculty member uh, in the JSGS and I will be your moderator for today's event. As many of you know, we are one school with two campuses, so I would like to extend a warm uh, welcome to our colleagues and guests at the University of Saskatchewan campus, where the event there will be moderated by Professor Jeremy Rayner. Um, and today, the school is extremely pleased to welcome Professor Margot uh, Halbert. Margot has led research projects authored numerous journal articles, book chapters, and scholarly papers on a broad range of justice and policy topics, including Aboriginal justice, earth systems, water, energy, and food governance, adaptive governance, and climate change adaptation. And prior to embarking on a full-time academic career in 2005, Margot practiced law in private practice in Regina for 12 years and in corporate practice as the Assistant General Counsel for SAS Power for seven years. Margot is a coordinating lead author of Chapter 7, Risk Management and Decision Making in Relation to Sustainable Development of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, also known as IPCC. And this is in the special report on climate change, desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, food security, and greenhouse fluxes in terrestrial ecosystems in 2017 and uh, 19. And Margot is also a review editor for Chapter 14, North America of Working Group 2, contribution to the IPCC 6 assessment report, Climate Change 2021, uh, Impacts, Adaptation, and Vulnerability, and this is in the sixth assessment report uh, of 2019 and 20. So we are thrilled uh, to have Professor Hobart here today to talk about climate change, land and food, and the implications for Saskatchewan. And following the talk, we are going to entertain questions. But for now, please join me in welcoming Professor Margot Hobart. And thank you, uh, friends, family, colleagues. Uh, for coming today to hear uh, this presentation. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change uh, Special Report on Land and Climate, which is a daunting subject. I realized when I was looking at this this morning that it looks like it's going to be just about the intersection between climate change, land and food, and in fact the report covered all of these areas and then towards the end tried to bring them all together. So I have quite a bit of material to cover and I'm, I'm hoping to do it in about 40 minutes and then leave a lot of times for, to, for questions from the audience and, and Dr. Rayner in Saskatoon uh, will take questions from the Saskatoon audience uh, so that you can tell me what parts interest you and maybe we can explore some of them a bit deeper uh, in the question period. So I'll take questions at the end. So the presentation today I'm going to speak to, uh, first of all, is uh, the main findings from the Land and Climate Report. 
which we divided into four main sections when we were writing the summary for policymakers. First, we documented the people, the land, and climate in a changing world. We talked about response options in adaptation and mitigation. So we were combining adaptation and mitigation, so we call it response options to climate change and land and food. Uh, and then we ended with some enabling response options and what we can do now. So I'm going to uh, structure my presentation around that with uh, a focus on what this means for Saskatchewan. So this is a global assessment report uh, that's written at a global level using some examples regionally or locally to illustrate things. So I'll do my best to bring this down to uh, Saskatchewan. So first of all, I'm going to start out with, though, about what is the IPCC and why this special report. So some background on that. So who is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? It was established in 1988, this IPCC, and it provides scientific assessments regarding climate change to both governments at all levels, and it informs the United Nations Climate Conference uh, which is called the UNFCCC for short. So that's kind of the role of this Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. And as Bruno was mentioning, currently we're working on the sixth assessment report, which is due in about 2021-22. And I'm also working on the synthesis report that brings together all of the assessment reports and all of the special reports. You may have heard of the 1.5 report uh, that just came out. So we'll actually work on synthesizing the findings of all of the reports in the synthesis of AR6. So why the special report on land? Um, I'm showing you a slide which shows the countries that asked the IPCC for a special report on some topics that were near and dear to them. So you'll see Algeria was asking for a report on climate change and desertification. And that's, desertification basically means when land is turning into desert, when the area of desert is expanding. Uh, Saudi Arabia was also asking for a report on this. And uh, the United Nations uh, Convention on Desertification, which is another body, was uh, asking for this type of report. The European Union was asking for a report on agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Uh, and Ireland, who sponsored two of our meetings, wanted a report on climate change, food and agriculture, and CAN International on, uh, that's the Climate Advocacy Network, on food security and climate change. So basically, the IPCC put together this special report with an incredibly long, long name, and we shortened it at our first meeting to the report on land and climate. Okay. So the special report had 107 authors, and 40% of those um, were female, which was the first. Uh, 52 countries were represented by the authors, and uh, some of the statistics are up here. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that we received in our uh, review 28,275 review comments, which the, the CLAs, um, one of the seven, we had to respond to each and every one of those review comments. So at one uh, or two points in the process in uh, March when I was doing the last government distribution, I received twice uh, a a prompt from my server saying, you need to take this test because there's too many emails on your system and you got to prove you're not a robot. <laughs> <laughs> so they shut my email down while I had to do this test and, and it took a couple hours to get it back. So uh, there were many firsts for me in this report. So the process for the reports, uh, this is kind of a, a diagram you can look at from the top left where the scoping happened, which was in Ireland, uh, where the lead authors actually put together an outline and it's approved by the governments at a meeting. And then uh, authors are again selected who write this report, 
by getting together in meetings and then you see on the right hand column how many drafts of the reports that we, the authors prepared and we sent out for comment and received that total batch of 24,000 and some comments over the two years that we were doing this. And at the very end, you, we go to Geneva was the place where the World Meteorological Organization is. We present it to the governments and the summary for policymaker is approved. So it's quite a long process of a few years uh, to come up with this final output, which the, the cover page you see for the summary is there this special report on all of these topics crunched together, uh, climate change, desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, food security, and then greenhouse gas fluxes. So the chapters are listed on this slide, and I was the coordinating lead author. Oh, that slide is not showing up. There we go. I was the coordinating lead author of the last uh, last chapter, which was uh, risk management and decision making in relation to sustainable development. So the purpose of this chapter was to summarize all of the chapters that had come before it uh, and advise policymakers on how to uh, manage risk and make decisions. So I'll be speaking to the entire report, but know that my focus and my specialty was actually on the last chapter. So land is where we live. It's a source of our livelihoods, it's our identity, it's our farm, it's our landscape, and it's our plate that we're eating from. Uh, it's a source of greenhouse gases, but it's also a sink. So it actually absorbs greenhouse gases, and it plays a key role in this exchange of energy, water, and greenhouse gases or aerosols. So it's a critical resource and we rely on it for a whole bunch of things. And as you are probably all aware, humans are putting a lot of pressure on land to meet our needs, our needs for our livelihoods, our needs for our food, for the clothes we're wearing, uh, for everything that we do in our economy. And climate change is adding to these pressures. So land is stressed. Um, Human use directly affects 70% of land, and a quarter of the ice-free land is subject to human-induced degradation. So our soil is actually eroding uh, from 10 to 100 times uh, faster than our soil is actually forming. Um, so I'm showing you here uh, a graph and it's showing you the increase in temperatures over land which is the top line which is somewhat erratic versus the global mean average temperature over land and oceans so what it's showing you is that the temperature over land is increasing almost twice as much versus the temperature of global land and ocean so it's warming up faster over top of of land and with this global warming, we're seeing shifts of climate zones in many world regions, including an expansion of arid climate or dry climate zones and a contraction or reduction of polar climate zones. So they're moving, shifting northward. And with this, we're, having, we're seeing changing plants and animal species, changing animal ranges, abundances, and seasonal activities. So in this slide, what I'm showing you is what we as humans do with all of this 70% of the area of land that we are impacting directly. And starting from intensity, the least intensity, and moving to the right side of the dark diagram with the least intensity, you can see that we start with infrastructure and then cropland, pasture, and then at the far right, the forest and it's broken up into percentages and amounts, just to get you an idea of how humans are impacting our land. And this, of course, agriculture, food production, deforestation are some of the major drivers of climate change. 
And as food production is increasing, so are some of the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with agricultural productivity. On this, you see the changes in carbon dioxide, CH4, the second line from the top, which is methane, and then nitrous oxide, which are coming out of uh, an estimated 23% of total anthropogenic greenhouse gases from agricultural, forestry, and other land use. And this is kind of a bracket that uh, the climate modelers uh, use uh, to uh, determine different sources of greenhouse gas emissions. And these are the ones specific to land that we were most concerned with. So in that bucket, about one-third of total global emissions are made up from this, and land accounts for about 61% of anthropogenic um, methane. 50% of nitrogen that's applied to ag agricultural land isn't taken up by the crop, and this is also increasing the amount of nitrous oxide, which is another important greenhouse gas. Grazing lands are also another source of uh, anthropogenic emissions, which you can see on this slide. So as our agricultural production increases, these greenhouse gases are increasing. And here we show the increases in agricultural production using certain indicators on the left, which is use of nitrogen fertilizer. And this is kind of, it was entertaining to me. We first of all used this, uh, this graph and we showed the nitrogen and we had to move it all the way off the paper. So in order to make it easier to understand, we had to just delete some of the, uh, some of the graph so that you could actually see the top because the increase in nitrogen fertilizer is so astronomically big. Uh, in the last years in this graph of 2017. And number, the second from the top on this left-hand side is the increase in crop yields that we've been seeing. Uh, the irrigation volume is the third line. And then the total number of ruminant livestock, those are like cows, uh, is the fourth line. So our agricultural production is increasing. And this is also represented by the fact that our population and the calories per capita and our food consumption is increasing, which is in the uh, second, uh, second graph there. So interestingly, about 821 million are pe people are currently undernourished and about 2 billion adults are overweight or obese. And from the statistics I'm showing you, you'll see that our food system is under pressure to produce um, and climate change is putting pressure on our food security. So there's this back and forth relationship that's happening with our agriculture and the land use that we're using for agriculture. Pests and diseases are changing, which is affecting um, production negatively. Uh, and many of our practices um, that we do have need to be optimized and transported through technology transfer or other means to help other areas of the world adapt in the future. So climate change is making a challenging situation worse and undermining food security. What I'm showing you here is um, a, a risk exposure illustration. So we worked uh, on this using a Delphi method of a whole bunch of scientists getting together and reviewing a whole bunch of literature about climate change and the impact that it's having on our land and our food supply and came up with what the risk was using at the bottom the legend for the level of impact of risk, whether it was medium, low, or very high, and then assessing the literature and what's going to happen for food security in the event that we experience global warming in the future of from one degree at the bottom all the way up to potentially five degrees. So as you can see, with all of the uh, land use and food that we assessed at five degrees, things get very, very high and risky. So that means on the left-hand side, we have dry land water scarcity. 
So in the event that we have global warming of five degrees, the scientists are saying it's a very high risk that we're going to have dry land water scarcity experienced by the population, making them very vulnerable and at risk. So we did that for soil erosion, vegetation loss, wildfire, wildfire damage, permafrost degradation, uh, tropical crop yields. So this is the production of crop near the equator. Uh, and then the far right, which I'll speak to a little bit more around food security. Okay. So here's the, um, the food security a little closer so that you can see it. And what this is uh, illustrating is the vulnerability of food insecurity, its availability and access. And another uh, first for the IPCC is we've started to talk about shared socioeconomic pathways, which is a somewhat more recent uh, sharing in the summary for policymakers that I want to introduce you to today. And what has happened in climate modeling is, uh, in the last decade or so, is these shared socioeconomic pathways have been developed, and there are five of them. And these shared socioeconomic pathways range from shared socioeconomic pathway one, which is SSP1 here be behind me, which uh, assumes uh, an intensity of GHG emissions that's relatively low. So it means that we, as a world population, uh, we adopt sustainability practices. It means that we have a peak and a decline of population of about 7 billion in 2100, that high income and reduced inequalities is reflected around the globe, that we have effective land use regulation, less resource intense consumption, including food produced with low greenhouse gas emission systems. We lower our food waste uh, and we have free trade and environmentally friendly technologies and lifestyles. If we can do all of this very, very soon, then what you see here for our food insecurity is at the temperature ranges we're talking about that might occur because of the greenhouse gases currently in the atmosphere, our risk is fairly low. But in summary, SSP3, which is the socioeconomic uh, pathway uh, ascribed with high population and low income and continued inequalities in our world, uh, a very material intensive consumption and production with barriers to trade, so we can't trade food to areas that are starving, uh, and slow rates of technological change relative to other pathways, we actually have higher risks. So that's what we're communicating uh, to people. So the futures that we choose actually impact and affect the risks that we're exposed to uh, surrounding climate change. Okay. So uh, we are also focusing on where the transition. So the 1.5 report that preceded this, uh, this report dealt with 1.5 still achievable and the reason we want 1.5 is because 2 degrees actually exposes us to these risks. So we're continuing with that storyline, talking about the socioeconomic pathways that we choose in the future, the two that I read to you, one and three, actually make a big difference for risk around food insecurity that we experience in the future. Okay, okay so that was the gloom and doom. And now we move a into the things that we can do, the, what we're calling response options, uh, adaptation and mitigation to climate change. So I know in the crowd that I'm looking at, and I assume in Saskatoon over my shoulder, we've got all sorts and kinds in the crowd. So at the end, if there's questions, I've used some lingo, some language you don't accept or you don't understand, please, please ask. But when we say response options, we're really talking about adaptation and mitigation. And many things that we do um, can tackle this land degradation that we're worried about. So land degradation, which means loss of soil quality, land that is less resilient, 
right? Land that becomes degraded may actually become desert. So we, were, we have a chapter in, in, on each of those topics in this special report. But we can do things to change this. And we actually know that we can reverse uh, desertification and land degradation. So not in the report, guys. But anybody who's been in Saskatchewan for the last how many decades knows that in the 1930s we had a lot of desert going on here, right? Which was actually changed um, by the PFRA and by a lot of farmers and local community members who went out planting grass and converting what had been cropland that was blowing away to Alberta, converting it back to grassland, right? So we know that there's things that we can do. Uh, and as you know, as scientists, we love figures and we love tables. So this is the table about all of the good response options that are supported by the science uh, that would help alleviate land degradation and reverse this trend. There's high, medium, low in each of the boxes. That represents the confidence. Because again, this wasn't just drawn by a bunch of scientists thinking about what might work. It's based on a very numerous paged annex to the report that lists all the scientific literature that went to assessing this. So in respect of agriculture, we know that increasing food productivity, which Saskatchewan has done uh, in spades, that that helps uh, in mitigation. So I'm looking at the top right hand, or going from left to right, the top of this, that the columns represent mitigation, adaptation, desertification, land degradation, and food security. So if a response option like the one at the top, increased food productivity, uh, accentuates those things, then it gets a nice blue color, a nice solid blue color. And if the response option doesn't do so well, you get a red, pink, okay? So that's how you read this. So for the most part, many of these response options are um, assisting with both mitigation, adaptation, combating desertification, reversing land degradation, and maybe advancing food security. But there are some that don't meet all of the categories. If there's a blank, it means that we have no evidence, we're not sure, and if it's white, then um, it means um, probably nothing, but if it re it's red, it's a, it's a flag. So the first red that you see is reducing grassland conversion to cropland. Um, so when grassland is converted to cropland, it might impact, or sorry, it's the negative. So if we, if, if reduced grassland conversion to cropland, what happens to food security? So in order to retain nutrients in the soil, we like grassland, right? I, I was using the dirty 30s example. So we want to keep things grass. We don't want to put them into, um, into field necessarily because it's advancing uh, soil, storage of carbon in the soil. OK, I got that out. But when we do that, when we have grassland, it means we're not producing as much food. So that's why it gets a red for food security. I hope I explained that well. Double negative. OK, and then at the bottom, um, again, restoring and reducing conversion of peatlands. So we're trying to keep land as peatland. So this was big for Ireland, right? But again, it means we're not converting land to food producing land. So it might impact food security and our growing population. So that's what we're trying to depict. There's a whole bunch of response options. And this is just some of the criteria that was used for ranking those colors. Um, negligible, large, large, and again, a very quanti quantified uh, distinction for each of those, those colors. Okay, so combating degradation. There's many of those options that I just showed you that actually do combat degradation. And they have co-benefits. So this is a different way of looking at things. We used to, maybe 20 years ago or 15 years ago, just talk about adaptation. And then over here, we'd just talk about mitigation. And we've really come far in bringing these together and realizing that there's synergies to do things um, through increasing this carbon stocks in soil and biomass and through certain farming practices and systems 
and reducing deforestation. So this has been very, very topical in the last little while with the forest fires going on in Brazil. So there are many things that agricultural producers can do that have a good uh, impact on the environment. And some of them, I'm going to sound a little crazy here, but throughout the world, a new practice of agroforestry is happening. And we don't even think about that here in Canada. We either have forest, it's in the north, or we have agriculture. But we never think about the combination, like some areas of the world, where they have forests, forest cover, and they grow crops underneath their trees. Right? We don't think about this, and I'm not an expert, but where is the opportunity as our climate zones shift and our boreal forest moves north, where's the opportunity to do this? Another thing that uh, has been around for a long time but never had a lot of take up is biochar, which, show of hands, anybody actually know what that is? Wow, some, some techos in the uh, crowd, I didn't see there in Saskatoon, but it's actually a special kind of charcoal produced by controlled burning of plant matter, um, such as egg residues or wood waste, and it's used as a fertilizer. And it's putting, putting carbon back in the soil and replacing that nitrogen that I was talking about at the beginning. So we don't think about these things. Actually, another thing that came out because New Zealand is so um, developed in their forestry, putting, putting wood products into durable, long-lasting wood products is a way of storing carbon uh, in our homes. Wetland, shelter belts, uh, sustainable sourcing, and knowing that the products that we are buying are um, not damaging our environment and are low greenhouse gas emissions. Trade policies are very important when thinking about what we're buying and what its carbon footprint is. Hmm. So the way we produce food matters and dietary choices matter. Um, so when I was finished the report and part of the team communicating to the press, I got so many questions about, well, what are you going to tell the meat producers at home? <laughs> and um, from my perspective, it's an opportunity to have the lowest greenhouse gas produced food in the planet, right? So if we can... Uh, figure out our technology and our methods of production and that they are low greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas, we will have a marketing, uh, marketing ploy for our important Saskatchewan, our important Canadian uh, food products. There are so many certification programs I had to take an entire page to document these in my chapter that actually do certify low greenhouse gas or sustainable production of crops, biomass um, products. So this exists, and in Saskatchewan, I think we need to start thinking about it. Okay. So, greenhouse gases are attributed to the food system. Um, and not only in dietary change, but the reduction of food loss and waste. I'm going to move a bit quicker here, so we'll have time for questions. Uh, this is actually a really important uh, way that Saskatchewan and, and people in the world could actually reduce their greenhouse gases. About 20% of the food produced in the system gets lost. Food waste. That's the food you waste on your plate. That's food that gets, mm, goes bad in shipping or sits on the shelf, right? If we could actually prevent that food waste, we could save anywhere 10 to 12% of those greenhouse gas emissions for the sector. So there are some really interesting things uh, that can be done to reduce our greenhouse gas. Bioenergy and, and we call it uh, BEX. Bioenergy and carbon capture sequestration. That's what that BEX stands for. 
So um, here in Saskatchewan, we tend to beat up our government and our power utility for this carbon capture and sequestration, which is interesting to me um, because many of our climate change models rely very, very, very heavily on bioenergy and carbon capture sequestration, which is putting carbon back into the ground or back into the soil in order to solve climate change. But this is bioenergy carbon capture sequestration, not necessarily coal. But the message is clear that we need to start considering these types of um, technologies and practices and incenting them in order to meet our Paris agreements, which is keeping global warming well below two degrees. So this is what the climate models are talking about. So maybe here at the university, we've got uh, some scientists working on carbon capture sequestration, carbon sequestration uh, in a very large way. We need to be focusing on this for the future. Yeah. All of these response options involve people. So another big takeaway in our summary for policy makers was the importance of involving people. Indigenous and local knowledge, we received some accolades because we went so far in saying how important this was for our land practices to involve indigenous and local knowledge uh, in our assessments of what's going on. So using an example in the north, we have thinning ice, we have loss of permafrost which are becoming big issues. But using local knowledge and indigenous knowledge to understand these changes and track them, and using simple things like, oh, I didn't bring up my phone, I was afraid it would ring. You can track science through citizens uploading information into the iCloud for free. So we started to explore just all the ways that this could happen, even in relation to climate change, drought and flood, and the potential that was there, and the significant social and policy changes that could be made. But policy, markets, institutions, governance are needed to enable these changes. So never to be outdone with one table, we put all of the policies that support the response options into a table, which I won't bore you with. But we had to make a two-page bigger table. But the important takeaway is there was no one policy that's going to tackle land and climate change. So why do we get stuck on talking about one policy? There's regulations, there's voluntary changes in diet, oops, I said it. There's persuasive payment for ecosystem services, risk sharing mechanisms, even the policies that we have for drought and flood, when we think about it, insurance uh, retains our, our agricultural producers on land, which keeps it uh, resilient and producing crops. It's important. Our uh, flooding, uh, Flooding regulations in Saskatchewan are important because is our soil washing down into the uh, lake? What are we doing uh, with our floods and droughts? How are we managing our dams, our ecological flows? And where are we putting our solar and our wind farms? Because solar production takes a lot of land. So I know I have a friend, actually it's a friend of my husband's, who chopped down his forest to put up a solar farm. But solar is really good in places like uh, Nevada or Arizona where you have desert and the land's not doing anything. Or places like in Estevan where we have a huge area that was mined for coal that we could put solar farms on. So there's some really good locations for these things, but we need to consider the greenhouse gas footprint from the beginning to the very end. Uh, what do we do when the solar panels are worn out and don't work anymore? What happens to them? How do they get recycled? questions I keep myself up with at night. Um, so I'm going to skip along a little bit here. So early action in all sectors, we, we're really at what many people have called a climate crisis. And all hands are on the deck now. We need to have action in all sectors. Uh, and thinking about the long-term restoration of our land and the co-benefits. And this means agriculture. So we won't be able to reduce agricultural emissions unless we start including them in policy and unless we have the science to understand the emissions that agriculture makes and, and the practices to reduce it. 
Acting early will help minis minimize this, but we also need to do it iteratively, which means we can't just put a policy in place and leave it for a decade and hope it works. We actually have to start measuring the greenhouse gas impacts that our policies are having. We were really, really interested in our report. I'm going to try and wind up soon because I'm at the time I wanted to take with this, with the multi-bread basket failures. So Dave Sochin's in the audience from Park, and he led, I see him hiding there, a Visea project, and we were looking at the connection between South America weather patterns, they're called ENSO, or El Nino, La Nina patterns, and how they had some very interesting connections to Canada. But when you think about that, what that means is when we're having drought in South America, often we're having the same drought in North America. Well, now think about what that does to food. So if they can't produce food in South America and we can't produce it in Canada, ooh, that's a little bit of a problem. So that's what we're calling multi-bread basket failures. And then it causes prices to increase, which then causes food instability, food security instability, which we saw happening not so long ago in other parts of the world, which then results in migration and sometimes in conflict. We had a hard time finding peer-reviewed literature to link all of that together, but boy, we had a lot of discussion around, um, around uh, the table and into the evening about this. So policies are really important. And delaying mitigation uh, in other sectors and shifting the burden back to land to be this incredible sink that the global climate models are doing is problematic. So this is truly for the geeks, I apologize. This is back to those uh, socioeconomic pathways. We kind of modeled the trade-offs between land for forest and what that does to food security. Because if we have more forests to act as a sink, it means we may have less land to produce food. So how does that impact us and how does it impact the globe? Hmm. I've talked a bit about this, so I'm going to try winding up. So the land we're using to feed the world could could, could actually provide the biomass. We can do this with the land area that we have. But there's actions that we need to take to improve land, enhance food security, and improve nutrition. Some of those response actions. So I'm going to leave it there with you guys. Land is important, uh, but land can't do it all. We really need to do it as a uh, totalized effort. So I'll leave it there. I think I'm a little over what I want it to be. <laughs>